Before we start with today's podcast, I'd like to let you know that the dates for the Spring 2024 Immersive Photography Weekends have now been released. Most of the places have already been filled, but at the time of recording this, we do have five places left in March and one in May. So if you'd like to come to the Scottish countryside next year for a weekend of nature photography, connection and tasty plant-based foods, you can find all the details at photographicconnections.com. Hello and welcome to Photographic Connections, the podcast where we create connection to self, nature and others through the art of photography. My name is Kim Grant, the founder of Photographic Connections and your host for this podcast. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Alistair Benn onto the podcast. Alistair is a Scottish landscape photographer, well known for his honest and open discussions about the artistic world of photography. Alistair loves to empower people to use their cameras to authentically express themselves and on this episode he shares his personal journey with us including his life-changing trip to the Gobi Desert and how he now dedicates his working life to helping others tap into their creative self. So without further ado please join me in welcoming Alistair Ben. Hi Alistair thank you so much for coming on the podcast this week. You're more than welcome. Pleasure to meet you. And you. It's, it's a really pleasure to connect with you. I feel we're going to delve into some really interesting things today because you're a very open and honest photographer who really wants people to, to fully express themselves and explore their creativity. And that's something that, that's really fond and close to my heart as well. So I'm looking forward to delving into that with you today. But before we do, I wondered if you could go back to the beginning of your journey and share the story of what got you into photography in the first place. Right. Um, I'm excited about where, where we're going to go with this conversation too. I, I, I love it when we don't have a plan. Um, in terms of my photography, I, I first had a camera in my teens. I was probably about 13 or 14, I think, when I first got um, a little SLR. And I was living in the southern highlands of Scotland. We'd moved up from Glasgow when I was 12. And we'd sort of moved into sort of Perthshire, which for Scottish people know it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, part of Scotland, really where the Highlands start. Um, so I would just run around uh, pointing my camera at things I thought were cool, really, um, with no technical skill whatsoever. And and then, of course, that's very much play. It's kind of serious play, I think, when you're when you're a child. And then I didn't really pick up a camera again until my 30s. You know, you you head off to university, you get a job, you get married, you have kids, you know, and, and b- before you know it, you've, you don't have a lot of time to go and play uh, or even to be creative and so forth. So I, I didn't really pick up a camera again until 2001. So by that time, I was in my early to mid 30s. Um, and it was bird photography that was my passion back then. I've been a really, really keen birder since the age of about three. (laughs) Um, And uh, traveling around the world, looking at birds and with work. Um, And I I really just picked up a camera then, partly to to be fascinated with the subject and to take really close personal images of beautiful birds. I was living in the Far East by this time. Uh, And secondly, to relieve stress from work. Uh, I was in a very stressful career. I was in international finance and I was doing a lot of uh, maybe 100 long haul flights a year. So, I mean, I was really on the road all the time, flying all over the world. Um, And I had a very stressful life. Um, And I'm sure we'll come on to sort of mental health at some point in in the rest of the conversation. But without going too deeply, I was pretty stressed. Um, So obviously picking up a camera was a great opportunity to lose myself through the barrel of the lens uh, and get out of my own head for a few hours uh, when I had some free time. So that's the kind of potted history of how I started. Um, And obviously that was the beginning of a 20 year plus now journey that's been quite convoluted um, and has changed my life extraordinarily really. Mm, yes I love that you had that connection to to nature and photography from such a young age I, I got into photography when I was 16 so I can kind of relate to that getting into it when you were a teenager and that going out and just playing and interacting and 
being in Perthshire as well, I mean, that's such a beautiful part of, of the country that I can totally see why you were so inspired by that. It's um, yeah. it's lovely. So how do you think, because you, you, of course, now do photography professionally. So where did that transition come for you between doing it for play and that connection and mental health benefits into into making a living? Um, again, that was quite convoluted. Um, probably about Quite quickly, uh, I realized that photography was a very important part of my life. Um, I was kind of fortunate by the mid 2000s that I was running my own business. So I was my own boss, so I wasn't accountable to anybody. So I, I could take extended periods off work uh, with, without having to explain to my boss where I was. Um, and I found that that was where I was most happy. Um, you know, I, I was most happy when. I was playing rather than working. <laughs> um, I, as I approach my next birthday, which is at the weekend, um, in the diary it just says Alistair 16 again. Uh, and, and, and that hasn't really changed much since, since I was a kid, really. Um, but probably by the mid, probably about 2007, 2008, I kind of thought, listen, I, could, I, I think I might be able to do something with this and it could be quite interesting. Um, and the thing that was the transition for me was that I had got into landscape photography by about 2004, 2005. I'd been living in the Himalayas for quite a long time. I'd been living in Tibet for quite a long time. And I did a lot of night photography, but there was no learning material for night photography at that point in time, uh, just like nothing. Um, so I spent about three years just researching going out at night, um, photographing under all sorts of different conditions, trying to work out all this stuff out from first principles about how to get good exposures, how to focus, how to manage depth of field. Uh, so quite a technical deep dive into, into night photography. And I published my first ebook in 2012. So that, that was the first step. And um, I didn't know if I was going to sell any at all. But Michael Reichman, who the late Michael Reichman, unfortunately, who ran Luminous Landscape, um, I sent him a copy of it and he wrote a very, very glowing review in Luminous Landscape. And I remember the morning waking up and just seeing email after email after email of sales for, for this ebook. Um, and it just took off um, because it was the first ebook really about night photography uh, back in 2012. And that was it. I just thought, well, this is really easy. I can make money doing this. And, 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 and basically, uh, I haven't looked back since. Uh, so I'm very fortunate that we make, a, we make a good living from our work. Wow, that's incredible. And it's so beautiful from such a, you know, just to, to create that one thing and the first thing you create has such a positive response. I mean, that must yes. have been such a, an amazing feeling for you. A shock. Yeah. yeah. It, well, the, the problem is that it, it, it set a precedent that hasn't been repeated since. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the, yeah, it's like we peak too soon, don't we? Yeah. yeah I should have quit. quit earlier. <laughs> Um, it's very clear from your story that you've done a lot of travel around the world. And how do you think that has really fed into to what you do now? Because you clearly have a very open mind, but also a very deep understanding for the world. And and I just feel like your kind of broad open mind plays a really deep connection with now how you work with other people, but also how you express yourself in your images. Right. Um, I think I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the combination of nature and nurture. Um, I, I think we do have a character to us. Um, and, and I think even as a child, I was quite emotional, quite empathetic, quite compassionate, um, quite interested in the feelings of others, um, very aware of other people's feelings. And, and I think I spent a lot of my younger years really not really trying to not upset people and to be a positive influence rather than a negative influence. Um, I think anyone who's been bullied as a child realizes just how toxic uh, our relationships with other people can be. Uh, even when we, we think we're being playful, uh, we can actually be very hurtful. So I think I've always been quite sensitive in that nature. Um, my father was uh, a marine engineer. He used to spend most of his time traveling around the world uh, with his work. And I was fortunate as a kid to go out to sea quite often with him. So we'd go to the States and we'd go to Africa and <clears throat> all over the world with him. 
Um, and that kind of gave me that wanderlust, which in conjunction with my birding just gave me an excuse. It was just like, yeah, I want to go and see birds in China or I want to go and see birds in Borneo. Um, but then with my work, I, I was able to go and do lots of interesting things. Travel is uh, a very interesting way to tell you who you really are. Um, when you're faced with different cultures and different races and def different ethnicities and faiths and religions, uh, particularly in places like Tibet, you know, where it's very, very evident that you're dealing with people who are fundamentally so different from, from Westerners. Um, uh, and I, I built a very strong relationship with my feelings and emotions and, and how that that dictated who I was as a person and who I thought I was as a person. And I think many of us grow up with a very strong sense of expectation about what we're going to achieve or how successful we're going to be. And I think a lot of us kind of get stuck in a, a rut trying to out achieve our own expectations, be they financially or emotionally or whatever. Um, and I think I've... <laughs> I'm very happy that with the adult I've grown into become. I've never been happier in my own skin than I am today, uh, really. Um, I, I think I know who I am. I know my strengths. I know my weaknesses. And I know what I can do to help other people to break down those barriers between the idiot in their head that talks down to them all the time and talks negatively about them all the time and reminds them of their failures all the time. And the problem with that is, is that we listen to that 24-7 and the, the, the bottom line is that we build a picture of ourselves that simply isn't true. Um, and as an artist or a creative person, and you'll know this yourself, that we're so, people can become very reliant on external validation or what other people think about us or what other people think about our work. And unless we're happy with ourselves, every every rave review from it outside is pretty meaningless, really. You know, don't read the good ones, don't read the bad ones. <laughs> it's, it's kind of that sort of position. So I, I, I think, yes, travel's been a really important part of, of my life and my development, but equally so has been moving back to Scotland. Uh, it's 10 years ago now, just over 10 years since I came back. And I, honestly, if you'd asked me 15 years ago, you know, oh, do you think you'll move back to Scotland and live on the West Coast? Well, no, never. You know, I'm, I'm going to be a vagabond living in the Far East or, or wherever. So, you know, being prepared for unexpected turns is always interesting. I kind of came back here by accident. But yeah, in a, you know, the short answer to your question is, I think what art is, is a way for us to articulate perspectives and things we've learned about life and dealing with life and showing other people that we can change, we can develop, we can grow, we can have a different relationship with ourselves. And in doing so, it gives us a different relationship with everything. You, I'm, I'm like a Scottish bald Barbie doll. You pull the string and I'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> so apologies. Oh, no. <laughs> No, it's good. It's good. I, I love these deep dives that people go into explaining things because it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have to go away sometimes, don't we, in whatever way that, that is for us personally to discover ourselves and to understand the world. And as you rightly said there, you know, we never know what the future holds, where we're going to end up or what we're going to do. And I think it's just about being open to all of that. Um and I just love how you speak there about the artistic side of photography and that expression and, you know, showing ourselves and understanding the world through our images, because, you know, it's it's so true. And I don't know, I mean, I guess this, this is my own insecurities and my own upbringing. But like when I got into photography, I felt very restricted because I saw it as a very technical pursuit. And this is how you do it. And, you know, there was all this kind of feedback coming in and, and, and judgment about certain things. And it's all only been since I've gone back and reconnected with almost like my inner child and that emotions of actually what got me into photography that I feel the images I create now are so much more truer and authentic and they might not be everybody's cup of tea but it's like I don't care anymore because it's like to me they're much truer but it's like getting past that hurdle did you ever feel that when you were getting into photography? 
Yeah. Um, when, when I first mentioned my early teens, I, I talk about running around and pointing my camera at things that are cool. And when I got back into photography and started doing landscapes, I mean, bird photography is really easy in a way. It's technical, but, you know, you've got a clear focus. There's a clear subject. It's about the bird. Um, whereas landscape photography is a bit more abstract, you know, even if you're photographing big scenes, because um, there's no metaphor, there's no story, there's no, you know, people talk about building a story into your photography and stuff. But at the end of the day, you're just pointing your camera at stuff you think is cool. You know, that that's, that's it, really. And any metaphor or feelings or emotions or stories that we build into that are purely internal. And it's up to each viewer to, to look at that scene and it's what they bring to it is, is going to be what that photo is about. So you can photograph a tree leaning over a smaller tree and might, some people might see nurture or care or age or generational differences or they might be thinking about a grandparent that's just passed away or something like that. You know, the sort of nurture elements just where you have something big and something small, there's a relationship there. And relationships are the fundamental part of humanity, really. Um, so I think when I got back into photography and back into landscapes, I literally uh, started where I, I left off when I was 14 or 15 years old, which is, hey, that's cool. I'm going to point my camera at it. And I, I wasn't thinking about pleasing other people or uh, rules or guidelines or conventional aesthetics. And I joined a forum, I joined naturescapes.net in 2004 and started posting images, mostly birds, but occasional, occasional landscapes. And, you know, people would start giving me critique and saying, oh, well, you know, this is very unconventional and this doesn't work and you can't do that. And like an idiot, you know, like an insecurity, I listened to them and started to learn. I started to study. I started to read every book on composition that's ever been written. Um, and went through a period of about 10 years, really, where where I think I became a very classical photographer, you know, techni technical and structured, you know, to create images that most people would find attractive. And it worked, you know, I got, I got really well known. I gained a certain amount of notoriety in the industry. I think I grew up at a time where it was easier to do that. Um, you know, friends with like Mark Adamus and Guy Tal and, you know, the you know, like Bill Neal and Alex Noriega and, you know, the list of my buddies, Adam Gibbs, you know, the list of my buddies is like the who's who of contemporary landscape photography. And we all grew up to kind of together. And I got to the point in 2016 where I just thought, I hate this. I hate these images. I, they, they mean nothing to me. I'm making the same composition again and again and again, just with different stuff in it. Um, it was very formulaic, very structured, and you could go anywhere and make a good photograph, but they didn't. I didn't feel they were mine in a way. Um, and that was the cusp, that was the transition that took me to the Gobi Desert in January 2017, and then everything changed. You know, that, that was the, that, that's where my life just suddenly went from um, a complete breakdown of who I was into this new person who, what's it now? So that will be three, six, six and a bit years, nearly seven years. It was seven years in January that I went to the Gobi for the first time that seven years has changed me so fundamentally as to who I am. And I, I pay a lot of respect to my, my work as a creative person as the catalyst for that change. Mm. It really shows there, doesn't it? The, um, how life, like, I think we go through this a couple of times in life, don't we? It's like, we're almost like reborn and we rediscover ourselves in different places. What was it about the Gobi Desert that was just like so mesmerizing and life-changing for you? Right. Well, the, 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 the long answer is in my book, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, which is the, the, oblig the obligatory product placement in, in, yeah. any, in any conversation. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote a book out of, uh, called Out of Darkness, um, which is my first printed photo book. And I tell the story in great depth uh, and, and incredibly openly. Uh, I got some feedback from a, a buddy of mine saying that's an incredibly harrowing read. <laughs> um, so it is quite a deep uh, story. So in short, um, 
I've suffered or had suffered quite badly from anxiety and depression for about 30 years. Started when I was in my teens, very much through my 20s. And even though I was functional, there was definitely a shadow kind of hanging over me for, for most of my adult life. And it was getting worse. Um, so even though I was doing work that I loved doing and running workshops, which I really enjoyed and sort of hanging out with people, inside my head was a bit, was a bit of a mess. So in January of 2017, um, I said to my then wife, uh, my, my ex-wife, um, who was Chinese, that I needed to get away. So she'd done a bunch of research about the Gobi and literally three days later, we were on a plane flying across northern China to go and spend about three weeks in the desert. And um, as a classical landscape photographer using a 14 mil lens with that classic sort of foreground, midground background, uh, I was lost in this big empty space. Um, and so I, I, I decided rather than having a complete existential crisis that I would try something different. So I just thought, right, I'm going to go back to what I used to do which is if I think something looks cool, I'm going to point my camera at it. I'm not going to think, I'm not going to analyze, I'm not going to compose consciously. I'm just going to let everything be as intuitive as possible. And I did that for three weeks, um, mostly with a longer lens, like an 80 to 400. So a lot of those images are sort of three, 400 mil. So just picking out tiny little details in the landscape. Um, and when I got home from that trip, I kind of realized that I really liked the images, first of all. I felt a very, very strong connection to them. And I almost felt that they were playing out my relationship with my anxiety in that some of them were really dark, really, really dark. And, and I mean, not depressing. There was always a ray of hope in them. There was always light in them, but they were dark. Um, and others were really light and airy and soft and... and um, frivolous almost and I think they were just painting this emotional spectrum the, the picture of my emotional spectrum or an articulation of how I felt um, both the dark and the light and I started to analyze well why did I point my camera at that you know what was it about that scene that made me just think right that is so cool I want to do it so I started analyzing all the images and I only had about I ended up over the next two years, I ended up going back to the Gobi seven times. So, I, I, so once I'd been once on my own, I started running workshops there. So I, I went back seven times in total. The last time being like February 2019. So over that two year period, quite intense periods of time in the desert. And every time I went, I would do the same thing. I would just take photos that just spoke to me aesthetically so in 2018, I started to sit down and kind of work it all out and came up with five attributes of the landscape that make you engage with it. Um, and I've written a lot about this and talked a lot about this and made videos about it. But basically, the five triggers are luminosity, so light, contrast, which is obviously a big description. There's lots of different types of contrast, um, color atmosphere and geometry. So those five things, every scene you look at are made up of those five things, luminosity, contrast, color, atmosphere, and geometry. And that oddly became, um, I, I have found another couple since, but I don't talk about them yet because <laughs> I'm going to write a book about it. Um, but basically those five attributes guide us through the landscape and they're also a mirror to who we are in any given moment. So if we're feeling down, and you know, you might be drawn to darker scenes. You might be drawn to lighter scenes. You might be drawn to soft curves or you might be drawn to more angular, um, challenging uh, structures, you know, and being open to all of those means that you're open to your full potential. You know, if you only photograph one type of thing and you only ever photograph one type of thing because you think that that is either what you're known for or what people are going to like, then you just become a facsimile of yourself. You know, you just become, that's an old word. <laughs> we don't use that anymore, I guess. But, you know, the you, you just become a, a cliche. You know, you just become stuck in this very narrow 
this is what I want people to think I am. Whereas now I'll, I'll literally, I'll, I've gone back to just pointing my camera at whatever I think is cool because they're for me anyway. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's a long convoluted and quite complex story. Um, but I strongly believe in art, creativity, expression, emotional articulation as catalysts and passports to a better future for ourselves. And and the people I work with now in terms of mentorships or on the Express to Photography Forum that I run, the, the, the changes in people are remarkable, you know, from being agoraphobic, you know, just nervous wrecks to, to being mentors themselves, <laughs> you know, in, in three years. It, it's staggering to see the change in people. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm clearly uh, passionate and convinced of the value of what we're trying to do here. Um, and it's, uh, that's hugely satisfying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was going to get on there to the work that you do now in helping other people. But you know what you just said there, it's something that that's really hit home to me this year. Like I've really started to realise that when we really connect with our intuition and create from that place, the emotion in those images, I find it doesn't just mean stuff to us. But when I, I have a few times now where I've shared images side by side, images that I've created from a place that I feel like this is how we're told to do photography. And then from a place that comes from the heart and everybody will say that the image that's created that comes from the heart they feel something when they see it um and it's like got this added extra um so I very much believe that when we really connect to our emotions and that intuitive sense of what's really bringing us in that that emotion we're feeling is just energetically imprinted into the images that we end up um creating um and that's one thing I've seen on the photographic connections community that we only began in in March this year but you know in that short period of time the people that have been there since the beginning the the changes in them has been unbelievable the the confidence they now have and the expression they have and the the ability to go out and just respond to whatever they love and it's beautiful that you know we both have a kind of overlap there with what we're doing in in our work so yeah absolutely yeah. And, you know and and I think this is the important thing these days and and when I started out in photography 20 plus years ago quite a lot of people were kind of guarded about their influence. They were guarded about their own communities. They were guarded about their own customers or clients. Whereas now I find there's so much more openness in that, you know, I work with Adam Gibbs on a regular basis. We, we help each other out all the time. Um, you know, I've got so many friends who we support each other because we realize that even though we might be sharing a similar message, some people are going to hear you and resonate with your message more than mine, even though we're saying something fundamentally quite similar, just because of human nature, you know, you're, you're going to be more useful to them than I might be. And likewise, there might be people who I'm more connected to than you might be, you know, just because that's the way communities work. You know, so I think that diversity of what I'm happy is, is that, we seem to be leaving behind the generic form of photography. That that became, I think that kind of peaked maybe about four or five years ago. And what's happening now is that because it's harder to become established as a photographer in 2023 than it was in 2003, external validation is so much harder to get than, than it used to be, you know. I mean, I... I don't have a huge audience on social media, but I've got a pretty loyal following. You know, people people know who I am, but I'd hate to be trying to start out today. You know, that, that would be really depressing. Um, so I think we have to take back ownership of photography for ourselves. And even those of us who have a, a degree of influence now, authenticity seems to be the key word. We have to be authentic. When people, when people just think you're being generic or you're just uh, producing images because you know they're going to be well received I, th I think people kind of lose a bit of respect for you as well so I think we should lead by example and I think being authentic and being real and being free and not manipulative and um, you know trying to play the algorithms and all of that type of stuff 
if I had five million pounds in my bank account tomorrow, I would leave social media in a heartbeat. <laughs> I, I would just leave. It, it, it's I have no I have no love of it as a as a as a way of expressing myself or 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 talking to an audience. Um, but that unfortunately is the curse of what we do at this point in time. Mm. It's an interesting one, isn't it? There's a part of me, like I, I personally, I, I love posting videos on YouTube and, and Instagram, but it's like, I think it's from the place that I maybe come from now. Like I felt a lot of pressure in the past and like Facebook, for instance, I hate it. I'm off of Facebook now. Um, but there's something about putting these messages out there and, and, um, I guess positively, positively reaching people in some ways to, to maybe think about their photography a bit differently you know and you'd mentioned there about collaboration like you do with with Adam Gibbs and you know some people see this especially the YouTube world as like competition but I'm like no there's space for everybody and like you'd said earlier you know some people re will resonate with what you're saying more than me and more Adam more than you and all that kind of stuff and but I think the more of us that put that positive message out there and the more authenticity authenticity people see in the photography world, the more authentic they'll become in their, their own self-expression. And I think that can only be a, a positive thing. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, and um, you know, I, I agree that the, the videos I enjoy making the most are the ones that I enjoy making, you know, the ones that I'm just talking about my own point of view. Um <clears throat> Yeah, as, as soon as you start crossing that line between business and personal pleasure, um, there's always going to be a bit of a, a conflict there somewhere along the line. You know, working a business is different from just being free to do exactly what you want all the time. But yeah, on, on, on the whole, I, I do enjoy that process. Um, it's, yeah, so I agree 100% that, you know, we're as, as long as we're all, there, there's more and more people who are preaching that positivity now. Um, and I think that's a really good thing. I think it's really interesting as well. Like you'd mentioned this shift that maybe happened in the photography world about, you know, four years ago. It's like, you know, when I began photography, my dream was always to win a competition or to have an exhibition and stuff. But for me, it's, that doesn't interest me much at all anymore because I think what I really want to do with my photography is touch people's lives so that they can see photography and the healing benefits it can bring them. Um, so it's more about the sort of helping others than my own professional work and um, kind of being accoladed and put out there on, on the big screen, so to speak. Um, are you finding that because of your community and all the work you do with other people, for you now, do you feel it's, of course, your personal work is still very important as it is in my work, but do you feel it's actually that opening up other people and helping other people that your most joy comes from rather than maybe your own imagery? In terms of, you know, I, I think when when being a creative stroke educator is your work, then um, my own personal images are somehow a little bit detached from that now. You know, my my images aren't my product, um, perhaps as much as they were six, seven, eight years ago. You know, I had a really successful workshop business and, and your images are your calling card. You know, people come in your, your workshops because of that. Whereas I think more often now people come in the workshops, not just because of the images, because of what they think they're going to hear or how they're going to, you know, the, the, the experience they're going to have while, while we're on the road together. So, you know, it's much more whole it's a, it's a much bigger thing than just the photography. It's much more, you know, the stuff that's locked up inside my head. Um, and that's really important. So I, I think in terms of my work, I consider my work to be helping other photographers develop their unique and not just making better photographs, but making more meaningful photographs to them. You know, and, and understanding the role of their creativity in their personal development. I think that's my work now. In terms of contests and so forth, um, I think it's a natural thing for most people. You know, we, we can't deny that photography is a luxury. You know, be, being able to spend X amount of money on cameras and lenses and tripods and other gear um, and then travel somewhere to go and make photographs and just have the free time to go and do that is a luxury. You know, there's, there's, there's billions of people on this planet who 
you know, food, water, shelter, health is far, far more pressing to them. And the whole concept of exploring their personal development through their creative aesthetics is meaningless in, in, in many regards. So I think we have to instantly think of ourselves as fortunate. And, and what that basically means is, is that the creativity in this form, you know, using photography, is open to a, a relatively small percentage of people who can afford to do it. You know, they've got the money to pay for the gear, they've got the money to go to cool places, and they've got the money to take time off survival to, to actually just go out and be creative. So we're kind of lucky. You know, we're in a we're in the we're in the lucky set of people. Now, a byproduct of having that degree of security and financial ability is that we have an ego, you know, because we've, we've been successful enough in whatever it is we've done in our lives to have the money and the free time uh, to go and do these things. And I know there's a lot of people out there, myself included probably when I started, where being liked, being acknowledged, being praised and winning contests was was all part of, yes, you know, I have mastered this, you know, I'm good at this. Um, and, you know, I, I did it. I think 2012, I entered my first contest and right through 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, I think was the last time I kind of entered anything. And I did pretty well and, and, and you know, won, won some awards and stuff like that. But now it doesn't interest me at all. You know, in fact, I, I, I think there's a limited number of people who are truly qualified to critique images, meaningfully critique images in terms of they actually understand that an image can be incredible even if they don't like it, <laughs> you know, and, and they, people often confuse critique with opinion, you know, oh, well, if you did this, this and this, then it's good. Well, that's not necessarily the case, you know, that's, I always say, it's like if people walk into my a party at our house and they don't like the music that I'm playing in the house, and they change it to something that I don't like, is the ambience of the party better because they've got to decide the, what they want everyone to listen to? If someone tried to do that in your house, you'd throw them out, you know? But we do it with our creativity all the time. You know, we take that so personally. So I, I don't believe that contests are necessarily beneficial uh, to people's development. Um, I've judged enough of them in my time to know the flaws of them uh, in terms of uh, defining what is the best photograph or who is the best photographer who's presented their work. So that whole thing, to me, I just think is meaningless now. Um, I, I think most of us have fairly unhealthy relationships with ourselves. You know, we carry a lot of baggage from when we're kids. We carry a lot of baggage from our own expectations of who we're going to become and you know what we're going to achieve with our lives. And as we get older, um, it's easy to look back with regrets and, and all of these types of things. And I think creativity is just a catalyst. It's a way to tap into who we really are as opposed to either who we think we are or who we want to be. And those three things are completely different. You know, You've talked about reconnecting with your inner child uh, as a creative, uh, uh, well, a way of tapping into a, a more creative version of yourself. And kids don't need to be taught how to be creative. Kids are creative. You know, we, I remember clearly, you know, lying on the floor of our house, playing with boxes and zoo animals and soldiers and all of this type of stuff. and the flights of fancy in your imagination are running through the woods with a stick pretending you're chasing dragons or <clears throat> whatever. So kids don't need to be taught how to be creative, um, but adults need to be retaught how to be children, uh, I, I think. And, and it, it is, uh, you know, that, that idea that we need to be serious all the time. And it's, it's a juxtaposition between frivolity and lightheartedness in a very dark world at, at, the, at times. You know, there's a lot of horrible things going on all over the planet right now, from the conflicts in uh, Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, 
uh, any number of other little mini wars going on and then all the pandemic situation and then obviously climate change and all of these things you know there's a lot to be kind of miserable about but you know so to be frivolous and playful almost seems a bit disrespectful in that context um but you know we've been making art ever since we first worked out how to make a handprint on a wall of a cave um and it's a fundamental part of us understanding our place in the world and our perspectives and then sharing them with other people and i think as artists we have an obligation to to do these things because we can you know we can articulate we can express we can share how we feel and that openness that you mentioned earlier in in the podcast i am super open because i think it empowers other people to be open and and that i think is that is better than being closed. <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, that openness, it's like you say, it encourages other people to be open. And it also, it gets to the, the root of what it means to be human. I think we live in such a disconnected world nowadays. Of course, not everybody is disconnected, but there is a lot of people out there who feel very alone and lonely and not seen and not heard and who also, you know, just don't know how to express themselves. And I found in my own life that the art, writing, photography, you know, all these different, everything really artistic and, and being out in nature as well has given me the gift of being able to to speak. Um, you know, because like in my story, I, I didn't have a voice. I didn't feel like I had a voice growing up. And it was through photography and being able to connect with the world that I was able to visually have a voice. And then starting YouTube was like, I could now physically speak. And I feel it's so important because I've looked at my health throughout my life as well. And when I didn't have a voice, I was always ill. I caught every bug, virus. Um, I had infections all the time. But the moment I started creatively expressing myself, it was like that emotional release and all that energy being released into something. And that's just listening to what you were saying there about about art and being able to articulate. And I just feel it's such an important thing for everybody to have something, you know, there's so many different creative pursuits. So to find something that works for you and that speaks to you and to to find the time to to do it because it can play wonders, I think, to, to everybody's 100%, life. A hundred percent. And I mean, I, I've been playing guitar since I was 14. I mean, that's been my other big creative outlet pretty, pretty much my whole life. Even on holiday, I brought a guitar with me, you know, because it's, so I'm still plugging in and playing. Um, you know, to, to just... We, we need we need a release you know otherwise it's too easy for us to just get locked up in our own heads the whole time and like I said earlier on I mean I just think we can be quite unreliable in terms of appraising our own value and our own strengths um, it's easy to see weaknesses all the time and to feel small um, it's funny because I'm I'm 5'9 in height, which is what, 176 centimetres for those living in the 21st century. Um, and, and my wife's six foot, so she's 181 centimetres. So she kind of towers over me a little bit. And I couldn't imagine doing that when I was 17, you know, to, to, have, a, to have a partner who was clearly a lot taller than me. You know, because it's like, oh, God, it's, it's shattering your ego and, you know, you're, you're just a wee guy and all of that type of stuff. But no, it's great. I think it's the root, it's the root of all my back, back problems, of course, but, you know, <laughs> so looking up all the time. But, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, to, to just accept ourselves for who we are, you know, we're, we're not going to, I'm not going to change my height. So um, why, why, why worry about it? You know, it's, we, 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 we stress out about too many things. The world's bad enough as it is without inventing stuff. Was it Hemingway? I think it was Hemingway. It was either Hemingway or Mark Twain. I can never remember which, which one it was. He said, I've endured some terrible things in my life and some of them even happened. Um, you know, and, and I think that's, <clears throat> that's really, it's like a light switch going on. Once you realize that you create your own life through your thoughts and that that is not a reliable representation of A, who you are or what you're experiencing or the reality of the situation, it's almost like flip, flicking a switch or turning a coin over. Is that all of a sudden darkness can become light and you know, melancholy can become joy. You know, it, it, all of these are just perspectives. So 
yeah, I'm I'm super excited about my work and it's super excited to to where things are going to go over the next few years. And um, I've got a lot of things I want to do. So there'll be no retirement in this house. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, though, you know, because you're passionate about what you do. You've got this um, positivity and almost this this purpose, you know, and you're you're helping humanity, which is, is beautiful. And I think on that note, I think everyone, I'm sure, will be really excited to see where, where things go for you, Alistair, because you've got a very... A very clear vision, I think, and a very honest and authentic way to approaching your photography and your work. So I know I certainly am looking forward to, to seeing where things go. So I just wanted to, to thank you for your yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to um, to thank you for your time today. And for those who have really resonated with your story and don't already connect with you, where can they they go to find you? Um, the best home is expressive dot photography. Uh, that's our website. Um, on there is everything that we do, be it uh, ebooks, videos, workshops, uh, the Out of Darkness book, um, which was a labor of love beyond all compare. <laughs> um, yeah, whether that whether I do another book or not really depends on how long it takes me to recover from doing this one. Um, but yeah, expressive dot photography. And then from there, you'll find me on the usual social media type platforms and stuff like that. But yeah, our website is the best home to go to. Brilliant. Well, thank you again, Alistair. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this week's podcast. It really does mean the world to me. As mentioned at the beginning, if you'd like to come to Scotland in 2024 for a weekend of nature photography, human connection and tasty plant-based foods, you can find all the details for our immersive photography weekends at photographicconnections.com. And now that this podcast has come to an end, there's only one thing left for you to do. It's time to pick up your camera and head outdoors. There's so many incredible photographic opportunities just waiting for you to discover.